today to glorify you. Oh, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, thank you, Lord. Amen. Can you give God a hand clap? Number 429, 429, what an awesome hymn of praise when we all get to heaven. Sometimes we don't want to think about that, but when we all get to heaven, we're going to have a worship service that's out of the ballpark, as they say. And when we get there on one accord, lifting up our Heavenly Father, it says, sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace in the mansions bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory, our male chorus.
At this time, we're going to ask Deacon Kelly to come forth and give us our scripture selection, followed by our announcements by Mother Face around. tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto fame love of the brother, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is, of, is as grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of, of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower therefore falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading and understanding of his holy word this morning. But the problem is, oftentimes when you get more money, you don't know how to keep it. That would be a few amen. 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 The issue is not money coming. It's keeping the money that God blesses us with. So the scriptures are very clear. We've got to seek wisdom. What is wisdom? What is it talking about? God's word speaking to us, which is so, so important. So instead of seeking the stuff, we need to seek the Lord. And as we seek the Lord by way of his scriptures, he gives us wisdom and understanding to use that which he's given us. We've said this so often, we've got some um, elderly saints that are here, and they give these testimonies about, you know, parents had eight kids and ten kids, and they didn't have anything, and they used to eat chicken feet, whatever that is, and um, rice for breakfast, and they would get pulled on a salmon cake or something, and, and divide it up, and, and, and they survived. I'm like, wow, eight kids. Eating one chicken foot, that, that don't sound too good. But when you look at them now, they're healthy, and they're strong, and they've made it. And then we look at ourselves, and we're able to have these expensive meals and all these other things. And it seems like people are uh, becoming sick earlier in life, and uh, more weak. And we've got to examine ourselves. Maybe the rough days weren't so bad. Amen. Amen. Any of you to try to bless your kids and try to get them to the point that they didn't have to work, didn't have to work so hard, and then they become spoiled? Maybe it's tough times aren't so bad. I don't wish that on anybody per se, but maybe you need to go, maybe you just need to put something in your life that causes you to sweat. Nobody's saying anything. It's okay. To remind you of how blessed. Let's turn the air conditioner out. Okay, that was just to remind you 
how blessed you are. Remember, she is more precious than rubies, and all things you may desire cannot compare. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Please forgive us of our sins. For so many times we've sought out the wrong things. Lord, we thank you for the tough days because it taught us something. Even though many of us don't want to go back or don't want to do tough things, they're good for us. Lord, help us to have wisdom that in the good and the bad, we can always see you. Thank you for this opportunity of giving. Lord, some may not have anything to give, and that's fine. But Lord, help them to realize it's just not in money, but it's in their life. Yes. That they may give up their time, may give up their service unto you. Lord, thank you for what you're doing here at Ebenezer and how you've blessed us. Uh, for all the things that you've allowed us to do. Even those things that are not in need, you've allowed us to reach out and bless others. Thank you for the monies that are not only spent helping and assisting people here in our local area, but in foreign nations, Lord, such as Africa, Jamaica. Thank you, Lord, that we're touching people that will never meet, but you're still saving souls far and near. Now, Father, as this offering is taken up, let it glorify you. Help us to be cheerful givers today. And thank you for another day that you've made. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We ask our offices to come forward this time.
most humblest way that we know how. We didn't come to no shape, form, or fashion. We just come to glorify and lift up your holy name. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come together one more time. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for having a building to come to worship. Heavenly Father, there's so many that love to get together, but they don't have a place, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this building that's called Ebenezer. You allowed us to come together one more time. You didn't have to do it, but you did. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all that's under the sound of my voice right now. You have blessed us one more time. And we just want to thank you. You woke us up this morning, closed in our right mind. Heavenly Father, we had eyes to see, we had legs to walk, we had a, we had a voice to talk, and we had an appetite to eat. And we had a bed that we got up out of, Heavenly Father. We had a roof over our head, Heavenly Father, and, and we, we had transportation to come to this place to worship you. Heavenly Father, that's just a few that you have blessed you, that blessed us with. Heavenly Father, we cannot count all the blessings. We just want to, we want to thank you. Because without you, Heavenly Father, we could not have done any of these things. Every breath that we breathe, Heavenly Father, you give us this breath to breathe. Heavenly Father, thank you for the breath that we're breathing right now. Yes. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all the, I just don't want to call the names I mess up, but Heavenly Father, they know the ones that is in our midst mix today. Yes. Heavenly Father, they've been away for a while. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for showing your glory and your miracle work, Heavenly Father. You, you're just so wonderful that we can't thank you enough. Lord Jesus, most of all, teach us to pray. And teach us how to pray. Teach us to get out of ourselves and just let whatever you tell us to say, that we will say what you tell us to say. For this, thou people, thank you for having a father for Pastor Woods and Shelton of his father. I want to thank you for our former Pastor Gladney, having a father, and Pastor Irvin, and, and, and Sister Jones, having a father, Minister Jones, had the Lord mercy. Thank you, Jesus, for, for Minister Lucas, having a father. Just thank you for all our leaders. Look what you have done. You have placed these leaders in the midst of us. Thank you for the deacons. Thank you for the trustees. Thank you for all of the members that's in this church, Heavenly Father. That we will come together and be one unity, Heavenly Father. You said why there is together, why we gather in your name that you would be in the midst. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this. I want to thank you for all of the children, Heavenly Father, that's in school. That they won't drop out. They will continue to go and get their education, Heavenly yeah. Father. They will listen to their parents and not run away and do the thing that Satan would have them to do. Because they belong to you, Heavenly Father. Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for my children, my grandchildren, and my great our great grands. I say mine, but it's ours, Heavenly Father. Because they belong to you, Heavenly Father. You just let them to us. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for all of the parents that send this church that have children. Heavenly Father, we ask that you will continue to guide their mind that they will talk to the children, tell them the truth, the word, the word of God. That you, that they all can live because, and, and live because you tell, yes. tell us how yes. to do. Yes. You said, you said, train a child in the days of youth when he is old, he will not depart. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your map that you give us, that we can live down here, that we'll have a way to come to you. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless the sick and shut in the one that is not in our midst today. Heavenly Father, bless the one that wanted to be in this search today but could not make it. Heavenly Father, bless us that we continue to worship Thee and praise Thee. Bless the, bless the message that you already have that Pastor Wood's going to deliver to us. Heavenly Father, bless, bless him and then bless us have, have open ears, Heavenly Father, and accept the heart that we will accept your word. That we will not look around and say, well, this word is for such and such. Heavenly Father, your word is for each one of us. Thank you for your word, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, bless us, and we continue to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and ask you to bless us. Amen. Amen. You ready for God's word? I'm ready to preach. All right. All right. Grab those Bibles, please, and open them to 2 Corinthians. Book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5. Sometimes I just get anxious for the word. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. I've done this one or two times. I'm just going to come at 11 o'clock and just start preaching. 
Second Corinthians chapter five. Why don't you look at that 17 verse? I want to give you a little time to. especially going into 2 Corinthians because the history is very important. Many of you know the Corinthian church was a feisty church. They were full of the Spirit. The anointing of God actually flowed there. But many times they would fall out with each other. Because of that, Paul the Apostle, starting that church, had to correct them over and over again. But because the numbers were being added so quickly in the city of Corinth, to the body of Christ, there were those that rose up and felt that they no longer needed Paul's guidance. Uh, they felt that they could hear from the Lord themselves and did not need direction from elders. And because of that, some of them began to split the church. Uh, sectarianism began to come in. And people began to say that Paul was not anointed, that he did not have a word from the Lord. Uh, they began to go against his credentials. And the book of 2 Corinthians is Paul the Apostle coming back. And he's defending what the Lord has done in his life. Now this is very interesting because all of us know we don't have to defend the Lord. But Paul the Apostle wanted to lay down some things to let them know how God had worked in his life. As we go in our lives and we deal with others, always keep your testimony. Always remember what God has done in your life. Uh, Paul the Apostle talked about getting caught up into the third heavens. He talked about God using him even through the beatings and the heartaches. Even in that chapter 4, he goes in and talks about his ministry of suffering, that he was persecuted. He was beat down, but God was able to lift him back up. And then he begins to describe what ministry is all about. Can you imagine these people as they're looking at Paul the Apostle? A majority of them really love Paul, but there's a small group that are trying to do it their own way. Paul the Apostle is confident only in the Lord, but at the same time, he hurts for the people. I believe we know that God is in our midst when we actually care about the people that are around us. Now let me explain this. Caring about something, somebody that's around you is not just coming to church on Sunday and giving them a high five or a hug, but caring means that I'm going to pray for you, that I think about you during the week, and sometimes I'm going to pick up the phone or invite you out to lunch and dinner because I have taken a stake within your life. Paul the Apostle, even though there were people that were coming against them, he's saying, I'm not going to run from you. If I could just interject this, there's some people that are in your life and they're causing all kinds of havoc in your life, but you need to stand up and say, I'm not going anywhere. Even though you're treating me bad, even though you're talking about my mom and my dad, my cat, my dog, and my bird, I've got the Lord on my side and I realize that hurting people 
hurt people. Paul the Apostle takes it to another height. And he wants the people to understand what we're living for. Have you ever thought while we're here today, it, it's not just to show off our Sunday go to meeting clothes. It, it's just not to come out here just because it's another Sunday. But those who are the called have come to identify that Jesus is working in us. So Paul the Apostle teaches this church and he picks up, we'll pick up at that 10th verse of that 5th chapter. He said, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Yeah. Looking like Jesus. This church, because they had got out of hand, some of them, he wanted to bring it back to the point that it wasn't about Paul, that it wasn't about the people that were in the church, but it was all about Jesus, the Christ. And he reminds them, no matter how, how, how good you think you are, that we all are going to have to stand before the Lord. Now, I know there's some theologians here, and you've studied, you say, you know what, my sins are covered under the blood of Jesus, and they are, they really are. But that still does not negate all of us are going to have to stand before Jesus. Yes, we know that our salvation is secure. But when you begin to examine the scriptures, you'll find out that there are going to be rewards that are given out. I don't understand how the crowns are going to be distributed. But I know one thing, that everything that's done in this body, I'm going to say that again. Everything that's done in this body, everything that's done in this body, we will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I told this story one time. I, I've been before a judge one time in my life, at least that I remember. And I remember I, I got a speeding ticket. I was young and I was driving a Pinto and it had three cylinders. And the only way that I was able to get to 46 is because I was going downhill on Church Street. But that day a policeman <laughs> pulled me over. I got a ticket. And because it was my, my, first, my first ticket, I was able to go before the judge and I pleaded mercy. Now, I remember that day. My dad was with me that day. He said, make sure you put on your good clothes and, and don't say much of anything. Listen to the judge. And when he asked you, what is your plea? He said, plea for judgment. I, I remember going into that place and the judge was seated up high and I got real nervous. I was nervous because I realized if he didn't release me from this ticket, I was going to have to pay some money. And, and I'll be honest, I didn't understand the court system. I thought maybe they were going to put me in jail. And I was concerned concerned about this, but when I called out to the judge, prayer for judgment. I said, I, I, I just want mercy. He, he looked at my record and looked at that I was a young man in school and doing well, and he said, you know what? You release. All you got to do is just pay the court charges. Don't speed anymore. Man, with that astronomical thing on my mind, I can only imagine having to stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who knows all my thoughts and my intentions. Please, that day that I stood before that judge, I looked nice and humble, but to be honest with you, I was speeding and I wanted to speed and I was upset because I got caught. What happens when we stand before Jesus who knows every intent, knows every thought? There ought to be some amens in the house because there are some folks that are concerned right now because you can't hoodwink Jesus, but when we stand, notice that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, what will be your reward? Now the question comes is, if I'm saved, if, if you're not saved, your reward is going to be hell. That, uh, hell is a real place for real people. But those who are saved, who say that we're sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, then they're going to have to stand and give an account for what we've done. Notice he explains verse 11. He says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. Paul the Apostle pivots from this, and, and I can see their attention is grabbed at this point. We're going to have to stand before Jesus. We, we thought just getting saved, that was it, and, and it was our ticket to heaven. No, no, there's an accountability because he saved us. He's changed us. We're going to talk about that. And he says, knowing that we're going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and everything good and bad, he said, we persuade men. He says, we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your conscience. Paul the Apostle said, this is not about me. 
But this is about the calling that's on my life, and I realize how grave it is. Yeah. Do we realize what we are a part of? Do we realize what Jesus Christ did on that cross of Calvary, that we can even come to the house of the Lord this day and serve him and bless his name? He says, please understand, I, I know that there's a terror of the Lord. Now, now, this is deep reverence, but also Paul the Apostle is bringing a, a part here. He says, I fear the Lord. I know that he's the creator of heaven, the earth, and sea, and all that is in them. And sometimes we come to the house of the Lord, and we walk through our lives, and we really don't feel the Lord. Just because he doesn't get you in your mess does not mean that he doesn't know your mess, but it means that he's a gracious and kind God, and at any time, he can call your sins to light. There ought to be a few amens and mm -hmm's in the house, because when I think about the stuff that I've done, and the fact that he allows me to walk around, sometimes I just get a little nervous. You ever messed up in your life? I'm just talking to a couple of folks. You, you ever sin? Y'all talking to the saved people in the house, and you know, you know you need to repent real quick, but sometimes you want to carry the stuff a little bit. I'm, I'm just being honest with you. you. You know you need to go to the Lord, but you get a little nervous. You know the scriptures say, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, but you carry it into the next day, and you're wondering if God's judgment is going to come. He said, with this knowledge of having to stand before the Lord, we know the terror of the Lord. And look at verse 12. He explains it even more. He says, we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you an opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in harm. Paul, in essence, is saying here, he's saying, I know some of you disagree with me, and I'm not trying to prove myself again to you, because some of you are just looking at appearance. Uh, Paul, the apostle, he wasn't the most appealing person from the scripture. Some believe that he had an eye disease of a type. Uh, he wasn't as eloquent as some of the other folk. And Paul, the apostle, says, I tried to prove my stance going through this epistle, this letter. But please, you can't look at the outside, but you got to look at the inside. There should be some witness in the house. There are a lot of folks that look like Christians. There are a lot of people that look saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. But being in the church a little bit, I found out just because you got a big hat and a suit on, just because your shoes are shined, just because your nails are done and you've got color in your hair and you've got all of these things together does not mean that you're saved. Because I've seen the most holy looking folk cuss you out right after they shouted in the house of the Lord. Looking like Jesus. He said, it's not about us. I, I, I'm not trying to boast. Please understand that. But when you understand, I have a call on my life. Some of you need to understand, even as you're going through your life, it's really not about you. Because if it was about you, you would have gave up last week. You would have gave up last month. Are there any, just a few witnesses in the house? This way can be tough at times. Being a Christian ain't easy. Sometimes you just don't get up and you just feel so holy and sanctified. But some of you know when you got up this morning, you didn't feel like coming to church. In actuality, you felt like going somewhere else. You didn't feel like raising up your hand. But you understood the gravity of the calling. And though I don't feel like it, God is still worthy of all the praise. I think that is what sets us aside and puts us to the point of being really saved when we don't feel like praising him. But yet we can lift up our hands when we don't feel like praising him. But yet we can say hallelujah when we don't feel like praising him, but yet we understand how awesome he is. Yeah, awesome. Look at verse 13. We can understand this verse now. He said, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. Paul the Apostle said, I know as I'm going through this, some of you think that I've lost my mind. But I want you to know, if you think that I'm out of my mind, it's for God. I, I think we need some folks to lose their mind for God. I, we, we got a lot of crazy folks out there. We, we got people that are kidnapping kids and, and kids that are put into prostitution at seven and eight. These are crazy folks. We got folks that, that are doing all kinds of things, will kill you and then go home and eat dinner and not think a second thought about it. We've got some crazy folks out there. But wouldn't it be nice if folks be Began to get crazy for the Lord. And we go, wow, I don't know what's going on with them. But every time I see them, they got Jesus on their lips. Every time I see them, they're not perfect. Please understand that. But I can tell that they love the Lord. Notice if we are beside 
ourselves. It is for God, but he brings it to the point from the other Corinthians, for if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. Yeah. Paul the Apostle says, I'm trying to logically lay this out. I want you to understand who God is, what you're called to do, and even though the church is deviating in the wrong direction, God is still faithful. Yeah. Have you thought about these 66 books that God has laid out before us? Yeah, you may not understand them all, but there's got to be some scriptures that began to interject themselves in your life and challenge you. If you haven't been challenged by the word of God, I wonder if you're saved because this word will challenge you. You've ever wanted to do it your own way, but you open up the book and you began to read and you found out your way wasn't the right way and you were challenged to change. Look at verse 14. Paul says, okay, we're building on this. We understand the judgment seat looking like Jesus. For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge this, thus, that if one died for all, then all die. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for them themselves. But for him who died for them and rose again. And now, now I, I believe Paul the Apostle, as he as he's writing this, he's thinking that I once was a persecutor. I thought I was right. And, and, and on the Damascus Road, I was going after the Christians. I, I was actually known for dragging Christians. And, and some theologians believe he was a murderer himself. We know he held the coats of those who stoned Stephen. And I think as he thought back, he said, you know what? I'm not deserving. I'm not deserving of God's grace and mercy. And even in my ministry towards you, I may want to give up. But he says something is happening in my life. He says the love of Christ, it compels us. It, it, it moves us. There, there's, there's a few saints in the house that know when, you, when you've been changed on the inside, love drives you. It, it does. Sometimes we, we try to push it aside, but there's, there's something inside of us that pushes us. It said it compels us because we judge thus. If one died for all, then all die. What Paul the Apostle in his language is bringing forth, he's saying Christ is the propitiation. He's the one who took our sins and our issues and our lack of love, this love he gives us by what he did on the cross of Calvary. Notice here Paul the Apostle realized the love that was on the inside of him wasn't because that he was able to grow it, but it was all because of what Jesus did on Calvary. Therefore in verse 15, and he said, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for the themselves. The question of salvation is, who are you living for? Looking like Jesus. He did die for all of us. He, he died for the good, the bad, the murderers, the Jeffrey Dahmers. He died for everybody, but the fact is, will you receive what he's done for you? Yes, yes, the propitiation is for the entire world, but will you receive the sacrifice? You say, Pastor, I want to receive the sacrifice. Well, well, this is it. When you believe what he's done, it's done for you, then you understand he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves. You understand that there was a death penalty that was put against you, and now Jesus Christ has lifted that death penalty, so now I'm not going to live the way I used to live, but now I live for him. I don't know about you, but that's good news for me to realize that Jesus on the cross, I should have been dead, but he changed me. I should have been gone. I should have been hell, but the Lord died for me. He lifted me up, and because of this fact, I no longer have to live for myself anymore. Look at this next part of this. He says, according, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Now, I, I want to go to this point because it's all about do you know Jesus? Is Jesus on the inside of you? Have you accepted his salvation on the cross of Calvary? And do you understand that when he died he didn't stay there. He's not in a tomb, but he rose again with all power for you. And if you know that, that's why we can understand that therefore, from now on we regard no one according to flesh. You look real good today. I, I, I want to commend you, but I cannot regard you according to your flesh because I've been hoodwinked and I've been bamboozled by folks who look good on the outside. So what I've got to do, i got to be able to see your heart and I'm not God, but a tree is known by the fruits. Therefore, 
so from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. She says, you, you don't have to look at me. Don't, don't look at my, my demeanor. Don't, don't, don't look at my eye disease. Don't, don't look at my hangups. Don't look at my stuttering. But I need you to look past, and I need you to see what God has done to me. There, there's some witness in the house. Some of you got scars and pains from your old life. Some of you got tats that are on your arm that diminish. They talk about the stuff that you did in your old life, and you'll never be able to get those things off of you. But don't look at my outside. Don't look at the mess up. Don't look the scar, but you gotta see what's happened on the inside of me. Don't, don't put me down because I don't dress like you. Don't put me down because I don't talk like you. But God is working on the inside. Look at that. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him. Thus, no longer. Paul the Apostle said there was one time in his life he knew Christ according to the flesh. What he's saying here, that others told him of Christ. Paul the Apostle, his ministry with the Pharisees and the Sadducees were during the same time that Jesus ministered. And he said, I heard of him. I understood of him. He was a very, very young child at that point. But he said, I heard of him. And even as he grew up, I heard about Jesus. And some of you are here today. You're on the testimony of someone. You heard about Jesus. You heard that he's a mind regulator. You heard that he's a healer. There are many people that go to church just for healing because they heard that Jesus is a healer. Please understand that's great and grand, but when you can get past trying to get something from him and you can say, I want to know him for myself. I don't want to just hear about him, but I want to experience him for myself. All of you know who like chocolate cake. It's a great thing to look at somebody else that's eating chocolate cake, but it's a better thing when you got your own piece of chocolate cake for yourself. And in the house of the Lord, so many people are selling for looking at chocolate cake, looking at sister so-and-so eat her chocolate chocolate cake and brother so and so eat her chocolate cake but I want to invite you to a man that will give you your own slice today and you can understand how sweet he is I'm in the book it said taste and see that the Lord is good looking like Jesus final verse of the day he says, since we, we understand this, we, we understand the judgment seat. We, we, we understand it's not about me. Don't look at my, my outside. I, I once knew Christ according to the flesh, but now I know him deep down on the inside because he's changed me. I've got a relationship. I met him on the Damascus Road. He says, therefore, Corinthians, and therefore, you're, you're struggling through this thing, but if we get to this point, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and then that's the question. Yeah. Who's in Christ? The statistics still say that, that the, the U.S. Is, is a Christian nation. Yeah, that's what the statistics say, but, but we all know that that is just not true. You, you ask the majority of people, they'll say that I'm, I'm saved, I, I love Jesus, I, I go to church. But, but when we, we see what they're saying, and, and then we look at what they're doing, and there's, there's a problem with that. And, and look at this, he said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the question that you've got to present to yourself today, are you in Christ? Now, we can look at your tree. We can look at the fruits. We, we can tell that, you know, if there's supposed to be pears on it and, and you got bananas coming off of it, there's a problem. And, and we can do all of that. But when it all comes down, you got to know, am I in Christ? Because if you're in Christ, look at this. He is a new creation. Now, now, King James Version says creature. I love this. This new King James says a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, now the question is, okay, I understand, I understand, Pastor. If, if, if I'm, I'm in Christ, then, then he changes me. I, I've accepted what he's done on the cross of Calvary. He's changing me. So are you saying that I'm supposed to be perfect? I'm not saying that you're supposed to be perfect, but I am saying that God has created you a new creation. Now, now I, I want to explain this to you a little, little further. I want you to give you a picture. He says, even though, even though in this process, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become due, we, we still fight with shadows. In Genesis, remember, God creates Adam and Eve out of dirt. Yes. He really does. He, he's there, and, and I wish I would have been there for the creative process, that he reaches down in dirt, yes. and he forms body. He creates body, but even as he creates the body, it's not alive. 
He says, the, the body does not become alive until he blows the breath of life. Therefore, we can have a body, but not have life on the inside of it. Now, we all know that even after their sin, they did not immediately die. But he told them, if you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. It took some time because at that time when they sinned, their spirit died, but yet their body was still living. See, some of us are struggling in our lives because we have not really truly saved. We, we haven't accepted Jesus Christ, and we've got a body that's walking around, and we're trying to look like Jesus, but yet we haven't been changed on the inside. Some of us are saved and saved. Sanctified, but we fight with shadows. Please understand this. After we've been created new on the inside, there's still the old man that shadows us. Now, I was thinking about this morning. Have you ever messed up yourself because of your shadow? Some of you know. You got up and, and, and it maybe was dark and in the nighttime and the light was there. And all of a sudden you saw your shadow but you didn't know it was your shadow. So you jumped and you hit your hand and you hurt yourself. And then you kind of laughed because you realized it was your shadow. And there's some of you that still get up and you walk around. It can be broad daylight but you'll look over your shoulder and you'll see your shadow and it will startle you. Isn't it amazing that there are folks that are saved but they're still fighting with their shadow. The shadow shadow can't really do anything to you, but every now and then you'll catch yourself looking at your shadow, doing what your shadow wants you to do, and you'll find yourself hurt. But I want to let you know today, it's just a shadow, because if anybody be in Christ, he is a new creation. I want to let you know that sometimes it feels like you can't make it. Sometimes the devil will bring temptation your way, and he'll say, you know what, you got to yield to this temptation. But Jesus said, there's no temptation that's brought to man. You need to understand that I haven't gone through, but I've already worked it out in your favor. So what we got to come to the point that we feel like that we're about ready to burst at the seam, that we feel like that we can't look like Jesus. We can say, you know what? Jesus has saved me and sanctified. I, I feel like preaching a little bit. When I think about what Jesus has done in me, when the devil comes my way with that shadow stuff, I can say, you need to realize I used to do that. That was the way I used to be. But I realize you're just a shadow. You have fought me around all the days of my life, but please understand, I gotta stand before the judgment seat for everything good and bad that's done in the body. And then what you gotta do, even though the temptation is coming at you, you gotta lift up your hand and say, Lord, I can't take this. If I do it my way, I'm going to mess up. But I guarantee you, if you call on the name of Jesus, if you go back to the cross of Calvary and say, you know what, the nails were put in his hand and the nails were put in his feet, blood came down that cross. Because of my sins and my grief, all of a sudden power will rise up in you. Jeremiah said it'll be like fire that's all shut up in your bones. When you realize Jesus died for you on that cross of Calvary and he took your judgment. And now when he got up on the third day with all power, he's done something for you. Those who come to the cross of Calvary can look up at the cross of Calvary and say, I'm not worthy to be here. Lord, I messed up over and over in my life. But you said in your word, if anybody be in Christ, Lord, I know I don't look like much. Lord, I know I got issues on the outside. But can you do something on the inside of me? Can you scoop down into the dirt like you did Adam and Eve? Can you put my arms back together again? Can you put new legs on me back again? Can you work on my mouth again? And once I get the frame together, say, God, can you blow your life on the inside? Are there any witnesses in the house? I'm not who I used to be. 
So every now and then you'll see me jump from my shower. You'll see me hit my hand and I'll say, ouch. But you gotta know, I'm a new creation. Old Saint said every day, it's sweeter and sweeter. Are you in Christ, Father? Thank you. Lord, we need to look like your son, Jesus. Yes, thank you, Lord. Examine us today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Search us. Thank you, Lord. Some of us have been pretending, Lord. We really did. Walking around with death on the inside, but... You told us if we get in you, we can be a new creation. Would you save like only you can save? In Jesus' name. As you're on your feet, I'm going to ask Pastor Meredith to come forth. and I'm going to ask Pastor Meredith to give an altar call for discipleship as our ministers come down and our intercessors come around. I, he's always blessed me just calling for the discipleship to be saved. And after that, I'm going to ask Mother Irvin, if you just come on up, I want you to pray for our altar call for those who may come and make their way up. So I'm going to ask Pastor Meredith to give us the, the altar call at this point, discipleship, how the Lord leads him. And Mother Irvin, after that, would you come and pray for us? Is there anyone who have heard the gospel preached today? You're already standing. You just need to walk this way. at this, but I just want to say for them, Lord has a way, that's mighty sweet, you can lay your burden down at his feet. Say hallelujah. Thank God for what you've done for me. We know you're able and you know you can, we know you will. And we just thank you for what you have done and what you're doing and continue to do. Do it in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, as we are preparing for communion, I want a special call for those who are sick and 
Maybe there's still some issues that are going on in your body. If you just come around us right now before we take communion, and Mother Erwin, I want her to just pray the prayer of faith. So come on up. There's some of you that have some sickness in your body, some illness in your body. And this, the message, these words, you realize in Christ you're a new creation. And you, you just you just want to come for there's some cancers that are in the place there's some tumors that are in the place I want you just to get around before we take communion today some of you know you've got some diagnosis and you're concerned there's some epilepsies lupus that are in the house just come forth and we're just going to give it to the Lord we don't know what he's going to do but mother Irvin has been on my heart just to pray the prayer of faith come on, I want to give you a little time right before our communion time we want to lift up this prayer unto the Lord and just kind of touch someone. All our intercessors are around. Come on for us. Some of you are dealing with some things. Addiction. Some of you have addiction. So just come on in the crowd. Nobody will know. Nobody will know that you're here specifically for an addiction. Some of you are struggling with some stuff. It can be just regular smoking and you just want to, you want to get rid of that. Come on. Come on. Get close to the altar. Asthma. Whatever it may be, we're going to pray the prayer of faith and we're just going to believe some of you are struggling with that. Come on, come on to the altar, come on to the altar. God is faithful. Some of you have some, some, some hormonal imbalances. You have some hormonal imbalances. You, you're just up and then you're down and you're fighting with depression. Come on around and just, just touch, touch someone as we pray, pray this prayer of faith. Mother Earth. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Yes. Most gracious God, just once again, you allowed us to assemble ourselves together. You allowed us to come to this altar knowing that you're God, you're God all by yourself. We come today, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, the crucified Lamb of God. We come because we know that he has healing, Lord. We know that he has healing in his garment. And, and that anything that we ask and we ask in his name, that he shall deliver and he shall give yes, to us. Yes. God, we thank you for the household of faith this morning. We thank you for all those who have come back to this church, Lord. You would touch their bodies, Lord, and gave them a reasonable portion of help to come to this place today that you've appointed for prayer. And Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we come here today for so many reasons, Lord. I came myself, I slept none last night. But today I knew I had to get here because there's power, Lord. There's power in numbers and there's power in, in, in numbers in those that come to Christ, Lord. We just thank you and praise you this morning, Lord. We ask that you put out a special blessing this morning and reach your hand. You don't have to reach your hand out, Lord. All you got to do is faint it, Lord. All you got to do is say, let it be, Lord. And we ask you for those with problems with hearing this morning, Lord. We ask those that can't see this morning. Lord, we ask for those that have high blood pressure this morning. Lord, we ask for those that have arthritis this morning. Lord, we ask for all diseases. Lord, we ask for money to cure illnesses, Lord. But all we need is prayer. Prayer is the answer because you have the answer. And until you get ready, Lord, until your people get ready, Lord, then you'll heal the land. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you this morning. We thank you for everything that has been done and said. We thank you for the minds of those that have come together around this altar this morning. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. Lord, would you touch the innermost parts of their heart, Lord? And if anything that shouldn't be, we ask that you remove it right now in the name of Jesus Christ. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are brand new, Lord. And Lord, we come, Lord, professing that we're saved by grace this morning. We're justified and glorified, Lord. And we just thank and praise you, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity. We could have woke up this morning, Lord, and not been able to move, but you gave us power, Lord. We didn't do it by ourselves, Lord, but you gave us power, Lord. You, I didn't sleep last night, but you gave me enough strength. You said you'd give us three score and ten in my reason of strength, and we know our strength comes from the Lord that made heaven and earth. And Lord, we thank and praise you, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus, this morning. Lord, we thank you for his spilled blood, Lord. We thank you for the crucifixion. Lamb yes, of God. And we thank you for your back went back to the Father that he knew we needed something to hold us, Lord. And you sent your Holy Spirit. So we ask that your Holy Spirit abide within us, Lord, from day to day, every hour, Lord. We need you, Lord. Please keep us. Don't let your spirit be removed from us, Lord. Without it, we have no hope. So we thank you and we praise you for all things, Lord. We love you now. We magnify you. And we praise your holy name, Lord. In Jesus' name,
still in the saving business. And I'm going to ask this brother to stand beside me to give his name and just why he's up here today. How's everybody doing, Ebenezer? Y'all might know me. I've been here for a while. I'm usually up in the sound room. And all I do is push buttons and whatnot. I don't say much. But I joined this church back in 2006. Came up here looking like a B2J, B2K reject, my hair and everything. But uh, when I when I dipped that time, I found myself being in the kiddie pool, still walking around on the float. And I feel I need to do it again. And when I do it this time, I'm doing it on the deep end. I'm a, I'm a belly flop on cannonball because no matter how far I sink, I know that God is going to bring me back to the surface. I'm a single parent, and this is my child. Some people might think she's my sister or other things, but this is my daughter. And I've been with her since her first breath. And me and her mom don't get along. A lot of y'all know that. Her mom has her own issues, and I ask that y'all pray for her. She has her own book to write, and I also have my own. But while I'm still here, I want to edit what's in my book. Change, change what's in that book, so at the end of my book, it will be a happy ending. So. I know those have prayed for me. Pastor's always been there for me. My brother Marcus Howard, Angie, Mr. Head, and I can go name names. Brother Moon, I can name names. Their prayers are great, but I need Jesus more than anything else. So I'm asking to be recharged, to be replenished, to be refilled, and give myself back to the Lord. This time, and I'm going to do it for real. Give him not, give him all of me, and not half of me. I want us to reach out. There's some people that can identify. Can you use the phone to your hands toward them and this family? Father, we just come in the name of Jesus again, Lord. And we thank you as we stand. We stand in concert with this young man, Derek, Lord, and his, his family. Lord, thank you, Lord. He's asking you to save him to the utmost. Yes, thank you, Lord. He's tired of the kiddie pool and float. Yes. But now he wants to jump into the deep end. Yes. Father, I thank you, God, that the baptism that will take place will just be a symbol on the outside, but a picture of the deepness of you, Father. Thank you for another chance. Thank you. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. Keep Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, thank you for salvation. Thank you. Amen. Is God good? Thank you, Lenny, if you pray over our bread and our juice. Thank you, God. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Heavenly Father, that you just bless us to be in the service one more time, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We call that you have blessed us to hear your word one more time, Heavenly Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your word will always be in our heart, Lord, that we can feast on your words daily, Heavenly Father. Father, that me and they like sin around the heart, just forgive us, Heavenly Father. We must all, Heavenly Father, we just come asking you that you would uh, uh, bless this bread and this juice, Lord, representing your son Jesus, his by was brewed and the blood that was spilled for our sin, Lord, on that old rugged cross, Heavenly Father. Help us, Lord, that we may do it in remembrance of him as long as we live up on this earth. Now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus went up into that upper room. It was just a regular pass over to everybody else. But he grabs the bread and he breaks it. Looks around at his disciples and there were 12 there. Intimate, close friends. Most theologians believe that Judas was sitting there. The one that will betray him. Because Jesus said, the one that dippeth in the tray with me, he's the one that's going to betray him. The question is, are we in Christ? Are we just sitting at the table? But we're the one that's going to betray him. For those that know they're in Christ, he said, as often as you eat this bread that's going to be broken for you on the cross of Calvary, do it in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. What an awesome picture. He grabs the goblet of the wine. Most believe he actually passed the same cup around. He said, this is, represents my blood. What a vivid picture. The color and from the foundation of the earth. Father God said, I've got to make sure that there's a fruit that will produce something that's red. Because every time they take a semblance of that, they're going to think about my blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. Jesus says, as often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. Let us drink. Can you see them as they go through that ritual all the time? But it was so, so real because Jesus understood in just a few hours he would be betrayed, beaten, and hung. But aren't you glad he did it all for us that we could look like Jesus, that we could be here today and say, I'm in Christ. I am a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Please come to your feet as we close out today. As we're still in the, still in the spirit of worship, don't forget Locust Grove. They have prepared food for us. It's out on the table right now. They have a, a large fellowship hall. Uh, easiest way to do it, 40 to 29. Go straight up to Brown Summit. Get at the Brown Summit exit. That's actually where Brother Ray Lenny lives at. Um, go to his exit 150, make a left. You're going to make two lefts, actually. You're going to get off the road, you're going to make a left, then you're going to make another left. Go up under the bridge. Keep straight for a few miles. You go around the curve, you see a few cows, if they still got them out there. And the church will be right there on your right-hand side. So come on down, 3 o'clock, we're worshiping, but they want us to come and eat their food. Well, Ray said, you go to the rural track, you're going too far. <laughs> Father, thank you for helping me to look like you. Thank you for helping the saints here to look like you. Forgive us for when we got caught up in our shadows. Done other things, Lord, and I still pray that if there's someone else that doesn't know you today, they'll give it all to you. They'll jump into the deep side. Yes. Now may the grace of you and the sweet communion of your Holy Spirit rest and rule in our lives this day and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you give somebody a hug before you leave today? Be blessed.